starting with robots.txt. What is it? We've talked a little bit about why it's important. We're going to look at how to generate that and test that robots.txt so that we can prevent duplicate content with our robots.txt. So robots.txt is just a simple file that is at the beginning of a website. It's one of the first files that the search spider will hit to see what it can read and what it cannot. So we can block files here. You can see for my site I've blocked different folders full of pictures and just random things. WordPress admin is a good thing to disallow from search spiders. You don't want someone being able to find your WordPress user admin from the search results. That's not something that needs to be in there. This sample file gives you a general example of the syntax involved with a robots.txt file. We're going to use the user agent and this means all user agents, Googlebot, Yahoo bot, AltaVista, whoever we're trying to block. The main purpose here is to keep search engine spiders out of those files and folders that you might not want them in. And this is just a wonderful tool for preventing duplicate content. You can have your total site index be quite large. You could have, say, 10,000 pages, but 2,000 of those might be the bread and butter, the really important stuff that people are going to find you through search to access that content. If you work for a publication maybe that has a print magazine, you don't want all of that content being indexed. So in order to block your content and your URLs and your folders from being indexed, you need that proper robots.txt syntax. So every single website will have a robots.txt file. You can check that on any random site and just go to their URL slash robots.txt and you'll see this file. So the most important thing with robots.txt is to block this duplicate content. You can keep your 10,000 pages and block 8,000 of them by putting them in that folder that disallows robots.txt. And if you're disallowing those folders in robots.txt with this syntax, that will keep those search spiders out of there. As much as Google always wants the user experience to be the same as the search engine experience, you sometimes may want to give users something that you don't necessarily want to give to search spiders. An example of this would be sizes on clothing, color, things that people might not search for because it's just extra duplicate content that you're adding into that search index. And I really like the terminology, and this is this is just made up between uh, myself and, and the late great Ted Stir from Webmaster World, who suggested we call these pages that we don't need indexed a French fry page. And a French fry page is just a page with little value. It doesn't need to be in that search index. Just like French fries have little or no nutritional value, these pages have little or no value to you in the Google search index. And it's really just wasting those crawl cycles, adding redundancy to your site, potentially confusing users depending on the type of duplicate content, with tag pages, with add-ons, with just circular navigation, or those printable pages that get indexed may cause a poor user experience. So these are all French fry pages that we don't want indexed. And we're going to block those with robots.txt using that syntax that you saw earlier. The main issues with these French fry pages is, again, that it potentially dilutes this link popularity by sending internal link equity to pages that really don't need to be indexed. And it can cause confusion and other problems as well. So we fix this with the robots.txt. We create a robots.txt disallow directory and block some of these products. Now, robots.txt isn't the only solution to taking out the trash, if you will, or reducing that duplicate content size and index bloat. And when I say index bloat, I mean the amount of pages that you have in Google's search index that don't need to be there. If you have extra pages in that index, you have index bloat. So in order to take out that bloat or take out that trash, we need to de-index those pages that are not of high quality. Those 8,000 pages that we talked about earlier, we need to get it down to that 2,000 page index in Google. And we do this with the robots exclusion protocol. Uh, this is our best bet. That's why I name it as the number one solution here. We can also do this with a no index, no follow, a meta tag, and you can see the example there. We can reduce the amount of duplicate URLs with rel canonical, and we can add a rel no follow that links to internal pages that we don't want indexed. So these are all solutions. Robots.txt is just the solution we want to use wherever possible. It's easier to retrofit with no index, no follow on an existing site sometimes. If you have URLs or orphan pages that are not in a category that you can easily block, or they're in a category where you want to leave some of the pages open and some of the pages uh, you would like to block. When you're generating 
your robots.txt, you need to keep in mind which folders you are going to block for that reason. And you want to block entire directories. You can't block thousands of files at the file level. It's not going to make sense and it's going to be too resource intensive when someone pulls that robots.txt file. You don't want a huge long robots.txt file, but you do want to block the areas that you can keep some of this duplicate content out. So that you need a little bit of foresight, a little bit of planning going into this. So you can generate a robots.txt file through Google Webmaster Tools or some of the online generators. And it's basically just going to give you that syntax for the folders that you want to block or the names of the bots that you may want to block. Again, you can do it with Google here. You can also do it with the SEO book tool, which is free. And he'll do allow, disallow, also include the sitemap URL. You can include that sitemap URL to give that robot or that spider the first signal that, hey, this is where our sitemap is located. And from this, you'll get the game plan or the site structure for the rest of the site. And putting your sitemap URL within the robots.txt is really important. It's a simple addition, something you can do easy, and gives Google that signal. So be sure to do that. You can generate that file again with robots.txt generator at SEO book. There's an analyzer located at the below URL there that will give you any errors that may be associated with your robots.txt file. The Google Webmaster Tools will do that as well. You can see I got one of the errors here with market motive, and it tells you what to correct here. You should not separate the blank lines command belonging to the same block of code. Please remove the empty line so that this gets read correctly. And you can go ahead and just look at some of the examples on larger sites. You can see CNN has a sitemap for the main index. For news, they have a news feed. They have a sitemap for their video. Again, you can do different sitemaps and tell the locations of those, as well as their list of all the places that they want to block as well. Probably look at Google as a good place to check out their robots.txt since it's publicly available. And you can see that they have a sitemap for webmasters. They have different hosted news ventures, different sites maps available there and so it gives you a good idea that you might want to set up multiple sitemaps and locations to them should be set from within that robots.txt. A few more resources uh, SEO book has a great write-up on this Wikipedia and then robots.txt.org is uh, the official place for information on robots.txt. The next tool I want to discuss in keeping that site index nice and lean and clean and not bloated is a 301 redirect. And redirects are used to tell the search engines, here's where my content was and I've moved it over here. There's several types of 300 redirects. You don't need to know anything really except for a 301 redirect. And we'll talk about the common uses of those, the types of different redirects that are available that you want to avoid and kind of keep your eye out for and then how to create a 301 redirect on different platforms depending on what you're working with. So there's lots of different types of redirects as I mentioned there's 404s, 301s, 200 code means okay. If you really want to look up these response codes you can do this on Wikipedia or someplace online very easily uh, just searching for those response codes. The one that you need to know most is that it's almost always a 301 redirect. If you need to move content from one place to another and preserve the link equity this is why we use a 301. In ASP and IIS, a 302 is the default, which technically means a temporary redirect. A 301 is a permanent redirect. So don't use meta refreshes, don't use 404s, don't use 200 OK on your 404 pages. Make sure if you're moving content, you let people know with that 301 redirect, and that will let the search spiders know as well that the link equity associated with this page should be transferred as well. So why it's most important is because you always need to redirect your users if you move or change content, but you can keep those URLs the same if you're using extensionless URLs and you have that good information architecture, but if you must move something, make sure you're doing it with a 301 redirect. That way, if there's links inbound to that page, it passes some of that link equity. There was a good discussion of this. Barry Schwartz did a, a write-up, and it addressed a video of Matt Cutts talking about that 301 redirect link equity passing to the new URL. And he kind of squashed a myth that said it might not pass all of that link equity. The 301 is the best way to pass link equity. Uh, he said that the total amount that dissipates through a 301 is currently identical to the amount of page rank that dissipates through a link, uh, which means if you redirect a page and a link is linking to that page, it will pass through to the page that you redirect to, to the new destination URL.
And this is an important concept for preserving that link equity when you are forced to move content. And if you're not using a 301 redirect, you're definitely not passing that link equity, which will do detriment to your site. If you'd like to know about the rest of the 300 redirects, here's those response codes from Wikipedia. You can see moved permanently versus found versus not modified, etc. So the best practices when it comes to 301 redirects, you're going to be using this for any expired contents. If you run a job board, for instance, and the job expires, if that job post page has some links, you want to preserve that and maybe just redirect that up to the appropriate category level that that job might have fallen into and keep that landing page, that centralized page, so you can preserve that link equity when people are linking to those pages. So if you're moving entire sites, I suggest looking up a guide. We have one here at SEO Moz, which is very good. And if you're moving content during site redesigns, there's more than just a 301 here that you need to keep in mind, but you're definitely going to be wanting to be using 301 redirects through that process of moving an entire site. And you want to do that effectively so that you only have to do it once and you don't have to continue to move content. In order to check for your different redirects, you're going to want what's called a header checker. And that's just so you can look at the heading of any given web page and see if you get a 200 response code, which is OK. It means it's found. It means it's here. If you get a 301 moved permanently on something like a www.domain.com, it might 301 redirect the non-WW version. Or in this case, you can see stuntdouble.com slash tools redirects to another URL there that's actually just a page with a date and it was just convenient to set up that 301 redirect and this way anything that links to stuntdouble.com slash tools will be permanently redirected to the address URL which is the final destination URL which will preserve that link equity and hold the links and any links that link to slash tools will be credited to that longer URL. So let's look at a simple example of setting up a .htaccess 301 redirect and .htaccess is just a file within the Apache web server. So again 301 redirects and how you set them up are going to be platform specific meaning that depending on the type of web host that your company or your website is using, you'll have to set it up a little bit differently. And I'll show you a tool for how to determine which platform your website is on in just a few moments. You're always going to want to use the relative URL for the first part, which is that redirect. It says I'm redirecting slash tools to that longer URL. And as you can see, it's just two simple lines of code that goes in that file. Redirect 301, the redirected URL first and the destination URL second and this would go in that HT access file in Apache. If you want to check out some other re redirect checkers you can do a Google search for header checkers and these are a couple of the available ones Internet Marketing Ninjas, SEO Consultants and SEO Book. You can test for different types of redirects with a Firefox web developer plugin. This is available for Chrome, I believe, as well. And you can see it'll test for meta redirects. So if you're trying to discover what's going on on a site, possibly that they have a meta refresh zero, you can disable that meta redirect and determine if that is in fact the case by disabling that and then and looking at the code there. So make sure that your company is not using the meta redirect. It's really not a good way to do that and you want to be using a 301 wherever possible. So keep that in mind and keep an eye out for those meta redirects. Definitely not the way to go. So it is, as I mentioned, platform specific. We looked at an example for Apache, which is commonly on Linux but can be on other servers as well. Apache is the web server or IIS is the web server, Cold Fusion, different platforms here. A 301 redirect can be done either at the server level or at the header level. So there's two different places within the code that we can place this 301 redirect. So first let's step back and take a look at how to identify your platform. There's several sites that do this, but built with is the easiest one to remember for me. You do builtwith.com slash your URL, and it will tell you what software, what ad services, what server information is available for that website. And you can see if you're running Apache or IIS or another common web host. So first off on Apache, if we want to redirect our www to our non-www redirect, this would be an example of that syntax. Rewrite condition on, HTTP host, 
etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And of course, there's nuances with this code, so don't just copy and paste it. Make sure you get someone that's informed on the subject. Do a little bit of research, and always, always back up your HT access files if you're doing this on Apache server. There's no easier and better way to blow up a web server and really make your bosses and the IT administrator angry than to mess up a .ht access file. It can take everything down quite quickly and you don't want to do that. So make sure you back up that file before you start playing with this and preferably don't do it on a live server. If you wanted to do an entire domain redirect from one to another, this would be the code example for that. And again, you'll find snippets for the code to do this on the web. For Apache, it's within this HT access file. It includes information about security, for about requests, about redirects. It's where you put that 301 redirect. You have to make sure that you have your rewrite engine turned to on. That is the module for what you'll often hear called mod rewrite. Mod rewrite is the function that needs to be turned on within that HT access file uh, so you can do this. Within Windows, in Internet Services Manager, you're going to right-click on the file of folder you wish to redirect, select a redirection URL, and then make sure that the exact URL entered above is a permanent redirection for this resource, and click Apply, and also select Permanent Redirect, because the default is a 302 within IIS. A PHP example, this would be a header level example of a 301 redirect would look a little bit something like this. This would go in your PHP code rather than on the web server. It's on the individual file at the file level or the page level rather than at the uh, domain or server level. An example of some ASP and other redirects are available here. You can see it's a little bit nuanced and different based on the platform that you are on. There's examples for many different platforms on the webcoms URL listed below. The last thing I want to cover here is just a quick mention of rel no follow and how this applies with robots.txt as well. These are again your tools for blocking duplicate content and redirecting old content or out of date or changed or moved content to preserve your link equity. And rel no follow is going to help with that as well. You can use it at the page level or at the site level so that you're not indexing deeper pages on your site. You can say, I'm at the third level of my domain and I don't want you to index the pages at the fourth level that I link to. And so you can put that in the link and you can see the example here of rel no follow. When I'm linking internally or I'm linking outbound, I can use the rel no follow qualifier. So it's a good example of a use of no follow would be as if you run a forum and you want to allow profile links. You don't want any new user to just be able to put a link up to their site. So you put a rel no follow until they have a certain amount of posts, until you trust them uh, enough to have that forum signature. If you allow blog comments, this was the original reason for rel no follow, to prevent blog spam because people were just commenting on blogs just to get the links. So that's one common area you can use rel no follow. You can also use it to just keep those pages out of the index, to keep that the low quality content out of the index as a additional tool to robots.txt. So this, along with your 300 redirects, and along with robots.txt, is going to be the tools to prevent those problems, to prevent that duplicate content, and to preserve the link equity by redirecting to the appropriate place.